What is what are some sadder things you've experienced? A lot of suicides. Uh-huh. A lot of suicides in Seattle. I don't know if it's a weather. Seattle used to be like number one or top ten for suicides in the nation. I don't know if it's because of the type of people that go there. I think it's the rain. It's always gloomy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. But lots of suicides from teenagers to older people. I mean, this one gal. Yeah, this, this, somebody at the bus stop saw the car parked, the windows blown out, and she slumped over the wheel. So we get there, and she shot herself in the head. Wow. Go back to her apartment, because we got the apartment off the plates and her yeah. ID. Went inside, and there's a note there, very clean place or whatever, and she said she killed herself not because she's in pain or sad, because she's bored of life. Bored of life. I've always thought of that. I've always thought of there's if there was a case like that out there. No, there is. And uh, her and place, I'm, yeah, her apartment was totally neat and tidy. Yeah. Um, it's not like she was depressed. Like a lot of depressed people just have it really oh, yeah. crappy and shitty, and let things go and trash and dishes. And you know, we've all been there. <laughs> I've ever thought of if like, you know, I'd ever like, not in like a sad or weird way, but like I ever thought I would get to that point where it's like, you know, like I've done everything. There's just nothing more to live for, you know, not in a bad way at all. That's a good thing to do. And honest to God, I'll be straight up. We've talked about this before, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Yes, but share. I have been your there. Rock bottom story to a point. Uh-huh. I wasn't ready to pull the trigger, but I got to admit, I was a cop. So you asked about like what happened after the Marine Corps. Well, I became a cop. Mm-hmm. During my career, I got sick. I was married, had a great wife at the time. Unfortunately, when I got sick, I have what they call celiac, and we didn't know this at the time. Mm-hmm. I went through Lyme disease treatments. I went through all, all these doctors. I flew out to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and 18 doctors said 18 different things, and they kept saying, well, J.D., you're just stressed out. You got a stressful job. I'm like, dude, knock it off. That's yeah. not the case. In a nutshell, um, I let myself go. I got chubby and out of shape and um, probably was drinking too much. There's no, well, there's no doubt we drank too much at the time. I mean, I'm not drunk, but... Yeah, and I thought you got on a car accident. I did. That's so, yeah, we'll back up. Okay. So I have metal in my neck. I had my T1, C7 fused. Mm-hmm. Up until that point, my life was normal. I cl- climbed to skied Mount Rainier. I do like seven to 10-day hikes solo mm-hmm. in the Cascades. I loved it. I lived in Snoqualmie Pass in the mountains. I skied. I just, my life was great. But the day of the surgery when I came to... Everything was different. So I think maybe my vagus nerve got stretched too much or nicked or my body's just not accepting the metal in my neck. Throughout then, I'm trying to heal and I've been on light duty and I fought the Mayo Clinic, all these hospitals and doctors, and nobody's really figuring it out. Mm-hmm. They know there's a problem because the muscle spasms, but yeah, they just thought maybe I was just stressed out or something. And I know myself very well. So that's kind of what led up to uh, me going getting diagnosed so i diagnosed myself uh the gulf war illness is on the factor the va says i have what they call gulf war illness that's an exposure to something whether it's the shots we took the experimental pills we took or if we got gassed or what we don't know um they swear up and down i didn't have lyme disease this naturopath swore up and down I had Lyme disease. So I went through all the treatments, even though I tested negative a bunch of times through this one lab. This other lab was a negative positive. So she ran with that. Mm-hmm. I don't diss her for that at all. I mean, it was my choice. But here now I'm pumping myself with intravenous antibiotics amongst the pills. It ate me alive. Antibiotics aren't good for you to begin with, yet tenfold mm-hmm. for like a year and a half. So it also broke me. It costs a lot of money because it's experimental stuff. Um, So during all this, I also tested positive for what they call celiac disease. So you know that gluten-free guy that everybody makes fun of? Yeah. Hello, Scooby. That's me. (laughs) So I used to, not to their faces, but I used to make fun of like, oh, gluten-free, whatever. Yeah. I didn't know what the hell gluten was until I got it. And it's a real thing. And if if I got it, trust me, folks, it's a real thing. So during all this, it was a pretty depressing time. My wife decides, we decided both, to, we're going to get a divorce. So I lived in this $65,000 trailer. It was really nice. And that was so if I lose my job, we can pack up and go. And the goal was go to Boise and just, we'll get on our feet one way or another. If I die, she can have my retirement. Mm-hmm. 
I drove a thousand dollar minivan. So the wife's gone. I have this trailer that I can't afford. Uh, I drive a thousand dollar minivan. She took the dog. <laughs> you know, so I'm <laughs> lonely dog. as hell. Yeah. I'm kind of dumpy and out of shape. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to lose my job. I'm sick and in pain. But, oh, now I'm in serious debt. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself. And every day you're make, getting made fun of at the yeah. bars for Dude, gluten. Dude, yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah. Now, thanks, man. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it is embarrassing ordering gluten-free, especially totally. in North Idaho. They're like, what? Now, I live at Sandpoint School. They, mm-hmm. they have gluten-free beer. So things got really low for me, like super low to where I've, and I, I sat on my bed several times where I pulled my gun out and, and I'm thinking of all the people that I've seen dead that killed themselves. And I'm thinking to myself, what went through their mind for them to pull a trigger or to slit their throat or this one gal wrapped a cord around her neck and sat on it and laid back. And she was a nurse. She knew what she was doing. Mm-hmm. She was depressed about her thesis. So she's you're going to kill thesis. yourself because she's depressed about her thesis. Wow. 21 year old girl. So, so sad. I know it was my first suicide too that I went on. Oh wow! So uh, th- th- things like this stick in your head. Yeah. Um, but you think about what's really going through people's minds when they get that bad, and now I'm finding myself kind of in their shoes. Like I can see how life can get so bad. So did I put the gun to my head saying I'm going to pull the trigger? No. But I've had the gun. Like, am I going to have to do this? I've sat there. I bawled. We're all human. Totally. So I'm not proud of this moment by any means i'm more embarrassed however would i ever do it again no Mm -hmm. because i've learned so much uh since then so i'm down and out with all those things i decided well my wife's already dating somebody Mm ex-wife i might as well go date somebody so i got online did the online dating and and i admit it kind of pepped me up however i'm not getting what i should be getting women wise because i'm all dumpy i'm just not the guy i don't have the confidence i needed Mm-hmm. You lose confidence, you lose everything, apparently. So, oh, a hundred percent. I never did pull the trigger. Yeah, um, I didn't tell many people at the time. Nobody knew about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just kept it all bottled up. And then one day, I'm coming home from work. I just met a gal like two days prior, and uh, and I witnessed this car accident on Highway uh, I ninety and Highway eighteen. So it's up by the town of Snoqualmie, North Bend area. And that is actually what got me to this. And this oh, is the Carnegie Carnegie Award. Uh-huh. So Carnegie Medal on this one here, which I'll explain later. And uh, that's actually it. I'll show it to you in a little bit. Cool. It's pretty rad. Yeah. But this day is what kind of turned my life around a little bit and made me realize I've got more in me than what I thought. Yeah. Which is why I like to share the story. So I see this accident, and basically it's got flames. It's on fire. 70 mile an hour truck and a stop vehicle. Boom, rear ended the stop vehicle. Mm-hmm. Instant flames, the driver, the vehicle, the car. Um, I don't, I'm just assuming it was dead. So I run across the freeway, traffic stop, and things are getting under control there. Um, but I'm, tunnel vision's kicking in. I run to the car, and the door's not opening. And I see this person slumped over the passenger seat from the driver's seat, uh, clearly unconscious. And flames are getting bigger and bigger, and I can't get the damn door open. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just been buckled up. So I just tried and tried and tried and tried. And uh, I remember my neck going out, like, and it hurt. But I was more embarrassed because I'm thinking, I can't get this door open. I'm <laughs> doing this motion over and over. I'm using my whole body to where this, I just kept hearing this voice, get away from the car, get away from the car. Mm-hmm. So I got a gun and a badge on my hip. I'm in a suit, basically, but except for without the, the jacket. I left that in the car. Brand new shirt that I loved very much so, mm-hmm. <laughs> which has been replaced, by the way. Okay. The door just miraculously pops open while well, I'm thinking, like, okay, I got to get this door open. I don't want to see her burn. Yeah. Dead or alive. It opens up, and I just remember stopping for a second going, holy shit, it opened. Yeah. Sweet. But now flames are getting bigger. But I don't re- – I, I wasn't fixated on that. I was fixated on her. Yeah. Turns out it was a female. 70-year-old lady named Carissa Carley. And I can say that because we're friends today. Mm-hmm. And her story's online. If you Google uh, just Carissa Carley uh, or Seattle Police, John Smith, mm-hmm. everybody knows me, so it's okay. You can, <laughs> now you know my name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I kneel in and trying to see if she's awake or whatever first. And I'm looking in the back seat, and there is no back seat. It's all the way munched, literally up to the back of her head. Wow. Which is probably what knocked her out to begin with. Mm-hmm. 
sending her head forward, which gave her 152 stitches across her forehead and up. Wow. Um, and so she's over. It's dead or alive. Didn't know if it was a guy or a girl. Hair's just kind of, you know, covering the face. And I get her up, and she's just bleeding profusely. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, shit, I don't have gloves on. It's all in my arms. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care. Was able to get her seatbelt. It's hard. You try to take dead weight, lift it up, hold it. She's a small gal, too. Mm-hmm. Undo the seatbelt and get her out of car. It's not easy. Mm-mm. You know, I don't have this kind of practice, necessarily. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I started dragging her across, and I remember me being fixated on her feet. One shoe's on, the other's off, and her heel's just dragging across the concrete or the asphalt. And uh, thinking, man, that's got to really hurt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, yeah. It's just the things that go through your mind. Yeah. And then I see a set of arms come up, and I realize, okay, there's a guy. Couldn't pick him out of anybody. Just I was just fixated. Hey, he grabbed her feet. Started running backwards away from the flames. I almost fell. I almost endoed. That would have been bad. Mm-hmm. So she would have gone head first, but I recovered. Got her to the other side. We set her down, and then the cars just kind of blew up. Big ball of flame, mm-hmm. and the gas tank didn't have anything to vent is what I'm assuming because it was just a huge ball of fire. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we got to pick her up again and move her to the other side of this truck that was right there. And It just – she she came to eventually, and uh, she was in shock, her. And we laugh about this all the time. We talk all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she just kept yelling, fuck, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> and because she's in shock, because I tell her, hey, it's okay. You were in a car wreck. It wasn't your fault. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and she kept doing that over and over. But mm-hmm. she goes to the hospital. She doesn't remember anything that has to do with this uh, this wreck. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, a few days later, I visit her in the hospital. It's a big thing on the news. It was a really neat story. Um she's living life. I think she's got to be 74, 75 now. This happened in ninth or in 2016. So July 18th, mm-hmm. that day that I did that, I remember when the fire department came, they put the flames out. They opened the street up for me to leave. Anyway, uh, I 90 was still shut down. They're just like free to go. Thanks man. Mm-hmm. I'm driving away, looking at the cars going, man, I still have that man in me that I've been looking for, for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to deal with even today. However, uh, man up, I moved on. I thought, you know, that was the changer of my life, that I, I would have quit way too soon. And I realized that there's always more inside you than what you have or can give. You think than what you think anyway. So totally. people want to give up. I, I believe they give up way too soon. You talk to the people that jump off the bridges that live. Yeah. They're saying, every one of them is saying, the first thing that went through their mind is they didn't want to die. Yeah. So once their foot leaves, they're like, shit, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. Too late. But they live and they got a second chance. But I had a second chance because, I mean, well, I didn't didn't pull the trigger. I don't even think I would have. You totally had a second chance. Totally. Totally. That is a very... I can ramble about that. Oh, yeah. Very impactful moment. Nah, didn't fuck up this time. It was just... Right, right, right. No, I don't care. (laughs) It was just so good. good. The screensaver came on. But yeah, I don't. I don't mind talking about it because it's it's just reality. I'm not the only one who's been there. You might yeah. have been there. Everybody's been there. Everybody's thought about it, totally. whether they were going to do it or not. And that's basically where I was. I might have been a step ahead of that, but um, here I'm a cop. I'm supposed to be taking the guns out of people's hands and talking them down. But I found myself in that position. So if you're going to take anything away from this, it would be just don't quit and know that there's always more. Just give it a chance. Mm-hmm. And that's a fact. That is a fact. I think that's a very good story. Good yeah. good message. I like that a lot. Good. Have you ever been in a hostage situation? I have been, but not not like you see in the movies where they're like moving away, like, I'll kill her, you yeah. know, and, and I take the shot and push. Yeah. Hero. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No Matrix uh, style. Hey, actually, I want to back up. Uh-huh. So I wanted to show you this. Oh, yeah. You, show us the metal. You can take that out if you'd like. I'll totally uh, just pull that little green thing, and that's the Carnegie Hero Award, and I, I got that. Oh, it's heavy. It is. It's not is gold, it, though. I think it's I copper. I was to say, is this I know. <laughs> Take a bite out of it. It's chocolate. No. <laughs> it's pretty rad. It's got uh, the date and everything and that I pulled it from oh. a fire. It was, it's just a neat thing, and I'm very humble about it. However, we're doing a podcast, and you wanted to see it, so I wanted yeah. to bring it. And Who is this? That's uh, Andrew Carnegie. Apparently, he's the richest man in the world back in the 1900s or 1800s. Wow. In 1902 is when the Carnegie Hero Award uh, came. 
and there were, I was less than 10,000 that have been given between the United States and Canada oh, wow. together. And he left his money there to fund this program. And so it's a, it's a big award, man. It's a hell of an honor just to know that I have this the day I changed my life and realized that it's because I didn't quit. Yeah, no, so, totally, totally, 100%. Yeah. Um, I guess so, this is kind of a stupid question, but what does that mean to you? Well, uh, honestly, it means a lot. Yeah. Uh, I don't pull it out. My Actually, it was still wrapped up. I just moved, you know, here about four months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was still in this office where everything's just kind of disarray. So I dug it out last night so I wouldn't forget it. But it means – it doesn't mean I'm a hero in my book. I know they call it that. I'm not a hero. I was at the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. I did the right things. Everything was – perfect there was there's a reason why it happened you can be religious spiritual or not but i was put there for a reason totally i mean i don't know if the other guys there. i don't think they would have gotten the door open not in time Mm -mm. so it was just timing Mm -hmm. so and i think that just kind of represents like dude don't quit man don't quit yeah so and i i swear to god i'll never quit i'll never quit again good i'll quit a relationship when it's time but uh i'm not gonna quit ever quit on life yeah totally yeah so that's what it represents in my book i love it i love it i love it 